Chapter 2 is Chemistry of Life. So this is chemistry basics and how they relate to biology. Basically why we need chemistry to live and for our bodies to function. I apologize in advance. This is a very long unit and there are a lot of slides in this lecture. First, there is a field of science called biochemistry, which is the life of chemistry. So how chemistry is related to life and why it is essential for life. So in biochemistry, we study the molecules that compose living organisms, which are carbohydrates, fats, proteins, and nucleic acids. And we understand why we need these things and how they help us understand cellular structures, basic physiology, nutrition, and overall health. Chemical elements are the simplest form of matter to possess unique chemical properties. Um, they are a pure substance, one single type of atom. Each element is identified by its atomic number, which is the number of protons in the nucleus. So every element is numbered based on how many protons it has. It doesn't matter how many electrons or neutrons it has, just protons. And it has to have that many protons. If it has a different number of protons, it is no longer that element. So the protons give it its identity and its number. The periodic table is arranged in order, starting at 1 and going up. So the first element on the table is going to be hydrogen, which has one proton. And then the next one would be helium, which has two. And then there'd be lithium, which has three and so forth. They go in order by protons or atomic number. Every element has a one or two letter symbol. Um, there are 24 elements that are important in our body out of the 91 natural elements. Um, six of them are very, very abundant in our body and they're very essential. We really need these. These six are oxygen, carbon, hydrogen, nitrogen, calcium, and phosphorus. They are very, very abundant and they make up about 98% of our body weight altogether. Trace elements. These are tiny little elements that there's very little trace of in our body, but they are also important. We also have minerals or inorganic elements that we get from soil, plants, food that we eat, things like that. These make up 4% of our body weight, and this mainly consists of calcium and phosphorus. Body structures such as bones and teeth really rely on things like calcium. Um, enzyme function relies on very important minerals. Nerves and muscle functions also rely on some of these minerals and elements. Okay, let's talk about atoms and what they are made of. So an atom has a nucleus, which is the very center. A nucleus is composed of protons and neutrons. So a proton is a single positively charged unit. It has a mass of one. So a proton is positive and it weighs one AMU or atomic mass unit. Neutrons. Neutrons are also in the nucleus and they have no charge. They're called neutrons because they are neutral. They also have a mass of one. So if we were trying to figure out the atomic mass of something, we would add up how many protons and neutrons that element has, and that would give us the atomic mass because each proton and each neutron are worth one atomic mass unit. So if we had an element that had five protons and five neutrons, that element would have a mass of 10. Electrons. So we also have electrons and atoms, but they are not in the nucleus. They are outside of the nucleus orbiting around like the planets do around the sun. They are orbiting around in electron orbitals. Okay, they never go into the nucleus. They always stay outside. Electrons virtually weigh nothing, so they do not contribute to the atomic mass. We don't need to count them to add up weight at all. And they are negatively charged. So on the outermost shell of an atom, so atoms can have anywhere from one to seven shells for the electrons to float around and orbit in. The outermost shell, no matter which number it is, the last one has electrons in it that are called valence electrons. 
So these are electrons in the outermost shell. These electrons are important for bonding. Okay, an atom is typically, as an atom sits on the periodic table, it's going to be electrically neutral. So it's not going to have a positive charge or a negative charge, but it's going to have positive and negative subatomic particles. So they're all going to have protons and electrons, but it's not going to have a charge. And that happens because all atoms that are on the periodic table are neutral because they have the same amount of protons as electrons. So if they have 10 protons, they have 10 positively charged particles. But they're also going to have 10 electrons, which are going to cancel out the positive charge of the protons. So essentially, the charge would come out to zero because one would cancel out the other. So every element on the table, the way it sits, is neutral. There is no charge. We can have charges, but on the periodic table, they're all neutral. So let's talk about isotopes. Isotopes are variations of atoms that have the same amount of protons and the same amount of electrons, but a different number of neutrons. So if you remember back to when we talked about protons, protons give an atom its identity. So a hydrogen atom is always going to have one proton. If it has more, it is not hydrogen. It has to have one proton, very specifically to be a hydrogen atom. It can have a different number of neutrons and a different number of electrons, but it has to have one proton. So when we change the number of neutrons, or we find an atom that has a different number of neutrons than it should have, it becomes an isotope. So it's still the same element, it's just a different version of it. So it's like different colored cars. They're all the same type of car, they just have different colors, right? So we have hydrogen, which has one proton, no neutrons. Then we can have hydrogen two, okay? Which is also called deuterium, it's hydrogen two. It has one proton and one neutron. So it's still hydrogen, but it has an extra neutron. So it's a different version, it's an isotope. So the extra neutrons add to the atomic weight because remember neutrons counted for one atomic mass unit. So if we add one neutron, we have to add one atomic mass unit. So isotopes of an element are typically very, very similar to the regular element because they're still the same element. They still have a lot of the same properties, but the weight is going to be different. So when we talk about them, we need to note the weight of them because that's how we figure out what is in these isotopes. That's how we can identify if it has a different number of neutrons. So hydrogen two would be hydrogen with a mass of two we would subtract one proton from the number of two because we know it has one proton, one proton, and then we would know that it has one neutron as well. Along with isotopes comes radioactivity. So this is where we get radiation from, except for the sun. So isotopes of an element typically behave the same as the element because again, they are still the same element. The hydrogen too was still hydrogen, but their physical behaviors can be slightly different. So radioisotopes are usually unstable. So these, these isotopes will decay and give off radiation, which is called radioactivity. Every element has at least one radioisotope. So every element has one version of instabil instability where it is radioactive. Um, we can use intense radiation to do things like destroy molecules. We can use this for cancer treatment, or a body can have this happening naturally, which can create free radicals, which cause cancer or mutations. So we can make it happen scientifically, or we can have it happen naturally. Um, the physical half-life of a radioisotope is the time that it takes for 50% of that isotope to decay. That's a half-life. The time it takes for half of the life to go away. And then the biological half-life is the time required for 50% of it to leave the body. So when we use radioactive isotopes, we really use them to date fossils um, and things that we find that are really, really old. When something dies, it has carbon in it, and specifically carbon-14 is the radioisotope of carbon. It decays. So we can test by how much carbon-14 is still in a fossil, how long it has been decaying, or how long it has been dead. So we use these in the body 
for dating things that are really old. We use them for x-rays. We use them for cancer treatment. And then they happen in the body on their own. We, we can encourage them to happen by, you know, doing things that are not healthy. Smoking, um, exposing ourselves to toxic chemicals. Those things can cause the isotopes to become less stable. And it can cause things like cancer or genetic mutations over time. So we talked about isotopes being an atom that has a different number of neutrons than it has on the periodic table. So the periodic table is the normal neutral version of every atom, every element. Isotope is a version that has a different number of neutrons. An ion is the version that has a different number of electrons. So now remember, electrons are not neutral like, like neutrons. And they don't weigh anything. So they're not going to change the weight of our atom, but they will change the charge because electrons are negatively charged. So an ion is a charged atom, an atom that has a charge of either positive or negative. Um, this happens when electrons are transferred from one atom to the other. And this happens during bonding. Um, an anion is a negatively charged atom and a cation is a positively charged atom. I was taught like way back when to remember them, angry ants and happy cats. Anion is negative, cation is positive. So ions that have opposite charges are going to attract because opposite opposites always attract, right? Magnets, the negative and the positive end are going to attract. Same thing is going to happen in ions. A negative ion is going to want to attract a positive ion because of the magnetivity. So ions, again, they form through bonding and chemical reactions. So if we have a neutral atom that has six protons and six electrons, if we lose one electron, now we have six protons and five electrons. The higher numbered subatomic particle is going to win in the charge. So if I have six positives and five negatives, I have more of the six, which is more of the positives. So it's going to become positively charged by the difference. So if there's one different, it's going to be a plus one charge. If there were two extra protons than electrons, it's going to be a plus two charge. If we lost three electrons and we had six protons, now we have three more positive than negative, it would be a three, posit a three plus charge. And remember, we can only give away or lose electrons. Never protons, because if we change the number of protons, we change the atom entirely to a different element. So protons can be given away or gained. If we gain an electron in an atom, now it has more negative. So if you have six protons and you gain two electrons, you have eight. We have two extra negatively charged things, making it a two negative charge. Okay, so ions are charged particles. They are very, very important in controlling some of the pumps in our body for our heart to work, our muscles to work. So ions do play a huge role in anatomy. Chemical bonds. So atoms want to bond with other atoms to satisfy something called the octet rule. And if you think about octet, it oct means eight, right? So the octet rule means that every atom wants eight valence electrons. If you remember back when we talked about electrons, a valence electron is the electron in the outermost orbital. This orbital is important for bonding. It's, its whole job is to bond with other elements and other atoms. So if you look at this picture, we have this atom. It has one electron in its outer shell. It's not happy. It wants eight. The ultimate goal is eight. Okay? If you have eight, you complete the outer shell. The most stable form of an atom comes with eight valence electrons. So every, every atom's goal is to get eight. They can get these extra electrons by bonding with another atom. So atoms who have eight valence electrons on their own, they are referred to as the noble gases. They don't want to bond because they're satisfied all on their own. They're not reactive. They don't bond. They just kind of hang out and do their own thing because they're happy. So the octet rule, eight valence electrons is the ultimate goal for every atom. If they don't have eight, they will bond with other elements to get eight. And if they do have eight, they don't bond. Once they bond with another element to get eight, they're satisfied. And they usually stay bonded until there's some kind of 
chemical reaction that pulls them apart. Although every atom without valence electrons wants to bond, they don't do it in the same way. So there are different types of bonds and they depend on what kind of atoms are trying to make these bonds. So first we're going to talk about covalent bonds. If you think about the prefix co, it means like working together, cooperating, you know, there's co-parenting, there's co-workers, cohabitation, that all means together, right? So in a covalent bond, atoms share electrons. You have two atoms that are missing some of their valence electrons. Maybe they have six, maybe they have seven, but they want that eighth one. And if they work together and they share what they have, they can both satisfy the octet rule by getting eight. So when things covalently bond, they both end up with eight valence electrons. They don't give away or take, but they share. If you are, if you are bonding and sharing a single set of electrons, it's a single bond. If you're sharing a double set or four in total electrons, it's a double bond. And if you're sharing a triple set or six electrons, it's a triple covalent bond. Usually covalent bonds occur between two non-metals. If you look at this picture, element A, whatever that is, it doesn't show us the nucleus, so I have no idea what it is. It has seven valence electrons. So does atom B seven valence electrons. They both need one more to satisfy the rule of eight. So if they share the single pair that they each have and share that two, now they each have eight because they have six of their own, but they're sharing two. So this is how a covalent bond works. They are sharing and they are working together. Here's an example of a covalent bond, but if you look in the middle where the two atoms are overlapping, there are four electrons in there. So this is not just a covalent bond, it is a double covalent bond because they are sharing two pairs of electrons. And if you count the electrons on the outer shell, including those four, each atom of oxygen has eight. Each one has four of its own, and then the four shared. Another example of a covalent bond are these nitrogen atoms. So these nitrogen atoms are sharing three sets of electrons with each other. This is a triple covalent bond and if you count the nitrogens each have two electrons and they are sharing six which makes eight for each. Again they have to satisfy that octet rule of having eight and they are sharing what they lack basically. The second type of bond is an ionic bond. If you remember what an ion is, it's an atom with a charge. So an ionic bond is when two charged atoms bond together. So in an ionic bond, there's no sharing. One atom is going to give its electrons to the other, and that, uh, that atom is going to take them. So you're going to have an atom that lacks electrons and an atom that has too many valence electrons. So the way it works is if you are closer to eight, so if you have five, six, seven valence electrons, you want to take, because it's easier to get to eight from five. And then if you have less than five, so if you have one, two, or three, you're going to give away your electrons. It's easier to get down to zero and default to that next orbital shell down. So when we're looking at electrons, they have orbital shells, and some of them have one, two, three, four, whatever it is, the outermost one is the most important. And it doesn't matter what number that outermost shell is. It could be the first shell, the second shell, the third shell. It doesn't matter as long as it's full. So if an atom has one valence electron in its outermost shell, it can give that one away, drop the outer shell because now it's empty, and default to the next level down. And the way it works when you're filling shells, you have to fill a shell completely before you can move on to the next one. So if an atom has four shells and it has one valence electron in the fourth shell, shells one, two, and three have to be full before they can move on to the next one. So if they drop that outer shell's one electron and default down one shell, that shell is full. So it's easier to get rid of the one electron if you have one valence electron than to go find seven more. So typically, if they have three, two, or one, they will give them away, and if they have five, six, or seven, they will take. 
So a metal is usually the ones that have one, two, or three that are going to give them away. And a non-metal are the ones that have five, six, or seven that we'll take. So when we have ionic bonds, we have metals and non-metals bonding. The metals will give the electrons to the non-metal to satisfy them. So let's say we have a metal that has one valence electron. It's going to look to bond with a non-metal that has seven because that non-metal only wants one because it doesn't want more than eight, it just wants eight. So the non-metal is gonna take one electron and only one electron. And then that non-metal or that metal wants to get rid of that one electron. So if that metal gets rid of the one, it defaults to the next shell, it's happy and full. If it gives that one away to the metal, the non-metal that is missing it, it's happy and full. We have an ionic bond. So when we have ionic bonds, things will only bond if it satisfies the octet rule. You won't have something bond if it doesn't complete itself. So in that situation, sometimes three different things can bond together. So if you look at this picture down here, we have a magnesium in the middle and two chlorine atoms. So chlorine has seven valence electrons. It's a halogen. How many valence electrons does it want if it has seven? Well, it only needs one more to be happy, right? So a chlorine ion is only going to take one valence electron. It will never take more because it will put it over its eight. And it will put it in the next shell and give it too many. It doesn't want that. It just wants one. When it gets one, it's happy. It's done bonding. It's over. So we have this magnesium ion that has two electrons to get rid of. It has two valence electrons in that outer shell that it wants to drop so it can default down to the other shell. So this magnesium atom comes around and it finds a chlorine atom and it says, hey, let's bond. I'm going to give you two electrons. The chlorine says, no, I don't want two. I only want one. I only need one. I only want one. But I have my friend over here, this other chlorine, that will take the other one because he also wants one. So this magnesium atom is actually going to bond to two chlorine atoms because now the chlorines are happy and the magnesium got rid of both of its extra electrons in the outer shell. So sometimes it's not a one-to-one -one ratio. Sometimes it's two to four. Sometimes it's three to one. Sometimes it's five to one. It just depends on what the atoms are. But an ionic bond, they're going to give away or transfer electrons from one atom to the other in order to satisfy the octet rule of everything involved in the bond. This magnesium ion would not bond with one chlorine. If there weren't two chlorines available, it wouldn't try to bond at all. So it has to be enough for it to satisfy itself. Magnesium would just float around still being magnesium with two valence electrons looking for something better to bond to. Okay, let's talk about water for a little bit. This is a little bit simpler. Um, everybody knows what water is. We're going to talk about water and the different kinds of mixtures and the different properties that it has. So water is the majority of our body, right? Most of our body is made of water, as so is most of the earth. Water is everywhere. It's in everything. It's essential for life everywhere. So um, most of the stuff in our bodies, even if it's not water, is something that is dissolved in water. So 50 to 75% of our body weight is water weight. And water is created by polar covalent bonds. And it's a V-shaped molecule. So actually, if, if you really look at a water molecule, it is V-shaped, but it looks like Mickey Mouse, his head and his ears. It's what a water molecule looks like. So water has different properties that support life. First, it's solvency. This is its ability to dissolve things. Cohesion, its ability to stick to itself. Adhesion, its ability to stick to other things. Chemical reactivity, its ability to participate in chemical reactions. And thermal stability, which is its ability to not heat up and lose heat really, really fast just with small temperature changes. All of these things are very, very important to water's ability to sustain life. So first, let's talk about polarity. So one of the really, really big properties of water is the fact that it is polar. If you think about what polar means, people say things are polar opposites or the poles. We have the North and South Poles. Those are magnetic parts of the Earth, right? That's where the gravity changes and the core has pull on things. So polarity has to do with like magnetic attraction. So water is polar because in a water molecule, the charges of positive and negative 
are unbalanced. So it's like a scale where it's heavier on one side and the other. And one side slightly negative and one side, is, one side is slightly positive. And if you think about things that are negative and positive, they attract to other things that are negative and positive. So in a water molecule, we have two hydrogens and one oxygen. The oxygen atom is much bigger than the hydrogen atom. So the oxygen is stronger. It has more protons, has more pulling power magnetically. So if I were to have an oxygen atom with all of its protons inside of it, and it has eight, and a hydrogen atom with one proton inside of it, which one do you think would attract more negative to that positive protons? Well, if the oxygen has eight, it's going to attract eight times more than that single hydrogen proton. So the oxygen pulls on the electrons a lot harder, pulling them closer to the center of the oxygen. So if you look at this model that looks like the upside down Mickey Mouse, you can see all the electrons in this bond are close to the hydrogen, are close to the oxygen and away from the hydrogen. There are no electrons on the outside of the hydrogen. So that means the negative charge leans towards the oxygen side. If the negative is leaning towards the oxygen side, the only thing left to lean the other way is the positive. So the hydrogens tend to be slightly positive and the oxygen tends to be slightly negative just because the distribution is not even. It's a neutral molecule, but the distribution of the charges is not even, making it slightly charged on either end. So this causes water molecules to easily attach to each other because there's a magnetic attraction between the positive and negative of different molecules. This positive and negative attraction between molecules forms hydrogen bonds. So these are little forces of attraction between a negative and a positively charged atom. In this case, it's the negatively charged oxygen attracting the positively charged hydrogen. We all know opposites attract. So if I have a negative oxygen, it's going to it's going to attract that positive hydrogen. And it could attract multiple because oxygen is so much bigger than hydrogen. So these bonds are very weak and they can be easily broken, but they're very important because it makes water easily attached to itself and they like to attach to themselves because when you have two magnets in your hand, they want to attract each other as long as they're opposites, right? It's hard to pull them apart, but it's easier to put them together. They like each other. They're attracted. So these water molecules always want to be together, and they always want to attract each other. And hydrogen bonds are specific to water. Remember that it's just water. Hydrogen bonds are just water. And it's the oxygen's negative charge attracting the hydrogen's positive charge. And then remember, these are neutral molecules. It's just unevenly balanced. More negative is on one end than... On the other, it doesn't mean it is negatively charged, it's just slightly off with its balance. Because water is polar, it has the ability to dissolve many, many things. So solvency is the ability to dissolve things. So water is considered the universal solvent because it can dissolve more things than any other solvent that we have found in our planet. Um, metabolic reactions in our body, so anything that is metabolism, requires water. And there are hydrophilic substances that dissolve in water. These are polar substances, just like water. So polar likes polar. So water will dissolve anything that is also polar. And the term hydrophilic means water loving. So anything that's hydrophilic is going to be polar and it's going to love water and it's going to dissolve really easily in it. Then we have hydrophobic substances, which if you think about what a phobia means, it means you don't like something. You're scared of it. You hate it. You don't want any part of it, right? So hydrophobic substances are nonpolar substances that do not dissolve in water, such as fats and oils. Those kind of things are going to be hydrophobic. They're going to separate from water. So in order for something to be soluble in water, it has to be polarized or have a charge. And an, an example of this would be salt, sodium chloride. Sodium chloride is an ionic bond between sodium and chlorine because it's a metal and a nonmetal. It's an ionic compound that easily breaks apart in water because it is charged and it can dissolve. So if it's polarized or charged ionically, it will dissolve in water. And again, water dissolves more things than any other liquid or solvent on our planet. 
Continuing on with why polarity makes water what it is, um, water also has properties called adhesion and cohesion. So first we have adhesion. If you think of the word adhesion, it sounds like adhesive. Adhesive means sticky, right? Bandages, tape, things like that. So water is basically adhesive. It has a tendency to stick or cling to other things. So water adheres to membranes in the body um, easily just because it likes to stick to things. So if you're driving down the road and it's raining, and you could see the water from the rain like running down your window. It doesn't just fly off. You know, it kind of like sticks to the window and rolls down. That's because adhesion. If you pour water on your table, it doesn't just like run away. It kind of like sticks a little bit. The drops can stick. That's because adhesion. Water is sticky. It likes to stick to things. And then water is also cohesive. And if you think of that, that prefix co again, it means like working together. Cohesion is when water works with water and sticks to itself. So cohesion is water likes other water. So if you pour water on top of water, it's going to stick to itself. If you have a drop of water and you put another drop of water on it, now you have one bigger drop of water because water will stick to water. And then if you put a few drops of water on a table and like stick your finger in it or a pencil, kind of drag it around slowly, the water will follow itself because water likes water. The reason it likes water is because of those hydrogen bonds caused by the polarity. So water will stick to itself, which is cohesion, and water will stick to other things, which is adhesion. Um, so when you're looking at like water and bugs can run across it, it's because water is cohesive and it sticks to itself, which causes a surface tension. So there's a slight little film over the water of bonds that certain things are light enough or less dense than the water and can easily stay on top of it. So surface tension is caused by cohesion of water. It's when water builds on itself, attaches to itself, and adhesion, water sticks to everything else. The last property of water, but one of the most important ones, is its thermal stability. Water is very uniquely stable when we change the heat or the cold. If we change the temperature, water is really, really independent on maintaining its, its own temperature. So thermal stability is also referred to as a high specific heat. This is how much heat it, it requires to raise one gram of something by one degree Celsius. So the specific heat of water is really high, meaning if you have a lake and it's 80 degrees outside today, and then it's 95 tomorrow, that lake is not going to increase 15 degrees because the temperature outside increased 15 degrees. The lake might only increase half a degree. It's because it takes a lot of heat to change the temperature of the water. So this is essential to life because what would happen if it went up 15 degrees and that lake went up 15 degrees and now the water is all boiling and hot? What would happen? What would happen to our bodies? If we were 98.6 degrees today, but tomorrow had a fever and we're 103, what would happen if our blood heat up it, our, our blood and all the water in our body heated up as much as our fever did? It, it would cause everything to fry. Like we would be so hot on the inside. If that lake heated up, all the fish might die. All the plants might die. So it's really important for water to be able to in, independently maintain its temperature without much, without the temperature outside having much impact on it. So thermal stability or a high specific heat is one of the biggest and most important properties that water can possess that is essential to life. Okay, so when we have water and we mix things into it or mix different things together, we come up with different types of mixtures. So mixtures are a complex mix of chemicals. So they can consist of substances that are physically blended but not chemically combined. Um, each substance retains its own chemical properties, but they are together. It can be separated, so the contents still re remain themselves. So a mixture is like a bucket of Legos. They're all mixed together, but you can easily identify every color and every shape of Legos, and we could separate them back out if we wanted to. So a mixture, it's just a physical mix, but not any chemically com no chemical combination. So again, with the Lego example... If the Legos are still solid and they're just mixed, it's easy to fix. Now, if we melted them and chemically changed them into mush, 
they would all blend together and then we probably wouldn't be able to get them separated. So a mixture, you can always re-separate it. It would be mixing vegetables together, mixing your Legos, things like that. So there are different types of mixtures. So mixtures of other substances in water are called solutions, colloids, and suspensions. So if we take anything else and mix it into water, it becomes one of those three things. So a solution is particles that are referred to as a solute and the agent, the solvent. I remember the difference between the solute and the solvent as you have to go into the vent. So the solute goes into the solvent. So if we were mixing sugar and water, the solute would be the sugar because it's going into the vent, which is the solvent, which would be water. So you should always have more solvent than solute. The solute goes into the solvent. The solvent does the dissolving and is a liquid. And the solute can be any state of matter, solid, liquid, or gas. So if I'm making Kool-Aid, I'm going to have water as my solvent, right? Because that's what I'm putting the stuff into. And I would have more water than Kool-Aid. And I would have more water than sugar. Because the water can't dissolve it if there's not more. It has to have more to do all the dissolving. So the solvent is the dissolving agent and the solute is a thing being dissolved. Okay, so now we have colloids. Colloids are mixtures of protein and water and it's obviously something we find inside the body. So many can change from, from a liquid to a gel state um, depending on where they are in the body and what they're doing in the body. Um, these particles remain permanently mixed and it doesn't settle. So a colloid will stay mixed even if you let it sit for four or five days. It's not going to separate. It's going to stay mixed. And usually they're cloudy. You can't see through them because whatever is mixed into the water, whatever proteins those are, they stay mixed and they constantly stay floating around suspended in that solution. A suspension is a solid mixed into a liquid. And if you think about what happens when you mix a solid and a liquid together, eventually, if you're not continuously mixing it, or if you don't remix it, the, sol the solid's going to sit float to the bottom because it weighs more, right? It's more dense and it's heavier. It will separate. Um, so they usually look cloudy or opaque in appearance when they are mixed. But then when they settle, sometimes it gets clearer in the liquid part, but not in the solid part. A suspension, the, the most common example of a suspension is liquid medications that you get from the pharmacy. You know, you have to always shake them up before you take them because if you look at it, it'll, the medicine will be on the bottom and just liquid will be on the top. That's a suspension. And if you read the bottle, it'll say suspension right on it. So you need to shake them back up because they will settle. And then we have emulsions. So emulsion is one liquid inside of another. They usually do not mix well. One usually settles at the top and it's Usually because the things are not alike. Usually it's a polar and a nonpolar thing. They don't really dissolve each other. So vinegar and oil, fat and breast milk, those are examples of emulsions. And if you ever have fresh milk, sometimes all of the cream will settle at the top because it hasn't been completely mixed. That's going to be an emulsion. It's going to separate. It's the fat separating from the milk. So here are some different examples of mixtures in relation to the human body. So when we draw labs, usually things come out in either a solution, a suspension, a colloid, or an emulsion. We use machines to spin blood to separate them. But some things settle on their own. So if you look at this first, the first test tube both on both diagrams, those are solutions. So if you look at A, it's blue. It's very, very evenly distributed, and you can completely see through it. That's a solution. So whatever was in there was completely dissolved. Okay, and then if you look at the drawing, you can see that all the particles are evenly spread out, and they're staying in that water. The next is a colloid. So a colloid looks a lot like a suspension in the fact that it, except for the fact that it's not, oh, it's not see-through. It's not transparent. It's going to be opaque or cloudy. So you're not going to be able to see through it. And if you look at B over here in the real picture, you can't see through it. You can't see the lines behind it. It looks like milk in a tube. So the molecules or the particles, whatever it is, 
are evenly spread out in the, in the liquid, but they are not dissolved. And then we have suspensions. So suspensions are either going to settle or stay like chunky. Um, and if you look at these blood tubes, you can see how they are different. They have settled. So C, it's mixed. But then D is the same sample of blood, but you can see that it has separated. There is some yellow fluid on top, and then the blood is on bottom. So it was mixed. It was probably shaken or spun, and then now it has settled and separated. So the suspension will be nice and evenly distributed when you shake it or mix it, and then when you stop, it will separate. The solids will go to the bottom, and the liquids will stay on the top. The pH scale. So the pH scale is what we use to measure how acidic or how basic something is. So the pH scale goes from 0 to 14. There's nothing higher than 14. 14 is the highest. Um, right in the middle at 7 is neutral. Our bodies are right around 7. Um, water is 7. It's pretty neutral. So anything lower than 7 is an acid. Anything higher than 7 is a base. So the lower the number, the more acidic. The higher the number, the more basic something is. So we can measure the concentration of something a, different, a few different ways. So we can measure by volume or how much liquid we have in a solution. So we can use the weight. So if we have IV saline, which is fluids that you pump into somebody's IV, if we have eight and a half grams of sodium chloride, which is table salt, per liter, that is a weight per volume. The weight is eight and a half grams, and the liter is volume. So eight and a half grams per liter is a weight per volume measurement of concentration. And remember, concentration is how much of something is in the solution. So we're measuring the concentration of sodium chloride in water. Um, milligrams per deciliters is really common. In anatomy and biology, that's mainly what we measure blood and lab results in. Um, you can measure the serum cholesterol, might be 200 milligrams per deciliter. That tells you how much cholesterol is in the body or in the sample of blood that was taken. Um, we can use percentages. We can say there's 5% dextrose, which is a sugar, in 100 milliliters of solution. So... We could say 5 grams and 100 milliliters, which would be by weight and volume. We could say 5%, which is percentage. Um, so we can use any of these to measure the concentration of something. But electrolytes are usually measured in equivalents. So electrolytes are crucial for heart, nerve, and muscle function. And they are potassium, sodium, magnesium, those type of things. So let's talk about energy. So we have two different types of energy in our body. We have potential and kinetic. Potential energy is potential. It means that it's energy that we have, but we're not actually using it. So it has the potential to be used as energy, but we're not really using it yet. Kinetic energy is energy that we are actually using because we are moving. We're doing something. So if you're walking, you're using kinetic energy. That's kinetic energy. You're moving. Um... If you look at these, this diagram of this girl holding the ball, the first one she's holding the ball. The ball's not moving. But the ball has the potential to move if she lets go of it, right? The ball has the potential to move if she lets go of it because of gravity. So she has potential energy in this ball, even though it is not moving. It does have the potential. The next one, the ball is actually falling. So the ball is in the process of moving. It is kinetic energy because it is moving. Uh, heat is kinetic energy. And it makes molecules move. And then there's electromagnetic energy, which is the kinetic energy of radiation. So radiation moves, and it, it's kinetic energy because it's moving, and it makes electromagnetic energy. So that's where magnet, magnetism comes from and why things are attracted to each other. And it's because little packets of radiation are moving around and they're making energy. Chemical reactions. So... Chemicals react with other chemicals for different things. We can make things, we can break things down, we can change things around. There's many different types of reactions. But it is a process which involves um, a covalent or ionic bond being broken or formed. 
So when something's bonding with something, it is a chemical reaction. When something is unbonding or the bond is being broken with something else, it is also a chemical reaction. So the chemical equation is the chemical formulas showing what is being put together or taken apart. So this picture is the chemical equation. It is showing that we have two H2 molecules, which is hydrogen, bonding with two O2 molecules of oxygen to make two water molecules. That is a chemical reaction. It's showing this that we're having, we're having hydrogen added to oxygen and it makes water. So when we're looking at the chemical, chemical equation, on the left side, you're always gonna have your reactants, which is what's going into your equation. And on the right side, you're gonna have your products. And then remember, when you're having, when you have products, it's something that was being produced, right? So it's always going to be on the right side of the equation, what comes out of the chemical reaction, the, what is produced in the reaction. And then chemical reactivity refers to the ability for something to participate in a chemical reaction. So something that is more chemically reactive is more likely to bond or unbond with something. It's more likely to participate in a reaction. Something that is not chemical react chemically reactive is not going to participate in a reaction. So there's different types of chemical reactions. First, we have a decomposition reaction. This one's pretty simple because if you think about what decomposition means, it means to break down. So in a decomp reaction, a large molecule breaks down into two or more smaller molecules. So in this example, we have A and B bonded together they break down and separate to form A and B. So we use these in our body to break down food and nutrients. When we eat food, it has to be broken down. We can't just, it doesn't go into our stomach and stay, you know, the same as it was. We have to break it down with enzymes and chemicals. So that is decomposition. Um, in cellular respiration, we break down glucose to make energy. And then in aerobic respiration, we also break down glucose to make energy. The next type of chemical reaction is a synthesis reaction. The word synthesis means to build, make, or create. So anytime we're synthesizing something, we're making something. So a synthesis reaction is opposite of a decomp reaction. So in a synthesis reaction, you're going to add two or more things together to make a bigger molecule. So in this situation, we have A plus B yields bonded AB. So um, examples of this are protein synthesis, which is when our body makes proteins. We have to build them up and make them. Or when we're growing, we have to make more bones, we have to make more muscles, we have to make more tissues. All these things occur through synthesis reactions from different chemicals, different elements, all these kinds of things. So not only can we take things apart and put things together with chemical reactions, we can switch things around. So when things are switched around during a chemical reaction, it's called an exchange reaction. So it's when you have a set of reactants that go in paired a certain way and come out paired differently. So in this chemical reaction, we have AB plus CD. They make AD and BC. They, they came out with different partners. Um, so this is an exchange reaction because things are being exchanged. So some of these reactions that occur in our body our stomach acid and sodium bicarb, those combine to make sodium chloride and a bicarbonate. This helps break things down. So something is exchanged. It's twisted around. It's changed. I like to think about this as, you know, you go, you have a date and you have a friend that has a date and you guys go to a dance or prom or whatever it is and you trade dates and come home with a different date. It's just swapping. Everything is just changing around. So since we talked about the three different types of reactions, from this picture, what do you think is occurring? Like, What type of reaction would this be? You have these single amino acids, and you have this chain of a protein molecule. So you start with single things, and then you have them connected together. So this would obviously be a synthesis reaction because we're starting smaller and building up to bigger. What type of reaction would this be? You have C, D, and A, B, and then they go into this chemical reaction and they come out as C, A, and D, B. So they're not breaking down, they're not growing, but they're switching around. So this would be an exchange reaction. And lastly, this reaction starts with something that's all attached and then it separates apart. So what kind of reaction 
take something that's solid and breaks it down to smaller pieces. That would be a decomposition reaction. It's breaking it down. Okay, so we have some reactions that are reversible, meaning they can go both ways. So a reversible reaction could go in either direction. So you can have products making reactants or reactants making products. Um, usually they go back and forth simultaneously. Um, these reactions are shown with a double arrow. So if you look at this one, the arrows are going both directions. Um, so one example of this in our body is the binding and unbinding of oxygen in our blood. So we breathe in, oxygen enters our lungs. Somehow it has to get in our blood. So way deep down in the very bottom of the branches of our lungs, we have these little things called alveolar sacs. This is where the actual oxygen exchange takes place. So within those sacs, we have blood. The blood has hemoglobin on it, which loves to bind with oxygen. So the blood travels through there. The oxygen's hanging out waiting. The blood will pick up the oxygen, drop off CO2 at the same time, and then move on, with, move on its way. It'll go into the heart, do the same thing in there, do its switcheroo, give the heart its oxygen, go through the body, give the tissues its oxygen, give the brain its oxygen, do whatever it does, and it'll go back to the lungs again, pick up more oxygen, drop off more CO2. And these things are being done both directions. It's picking up and dropping off all the time, oxygen and CO2, back and forth, back and forth. So this is a reversible reaction. It could go either way at any time. So any chemical reactions that happen in our body are referred to as metabolism. Um, we have different types of reactions that happen in our body. We have ones that release energy, which are decomposition reactions. They break covalent bonds and they make smaller molecules. So when we are making things smaller, we're obviously breaking them apart, right? So we're breaking the bonds in those things and we're making them smaller into smaller molecules. This is called catabolism. Then we have where we are storing energy. We're building things up. We're making new bonds. And every time a bond is made, energy is stored within that bond. So if we're building things up and making new bonds, we are storing energy. This is called anabolism. So in our body, we have metabolism. And within the metabolism, there are two different types, catabolism and anabolism. One is breaking things down and one is building things up. Here's a diagram of cell metabolism. So if you look, it has food. Food goes in, it becomes macromolecules. So when we eat food, it's not just eating chicken, it's protein, right? So it becomes a, mac a micromolecule, which is a, mac it's a macromolecule in our body. So we have our proteins, our carbs, our starches, whatever we ate, right? They come in and they get broken down by anabolism, right? Another type of chemical reaction that occurs on our body frequently are redox reactions. So these are reduction and oxidation reactions. And it's called redox because the reduction and the oxidation happens at the same time. So in a redox reaction, one thing is oxidized and the other thing is reduced. So... Electrons are transferred from one thing to the next, and they usually are transferred as hydrogen atoms. And a redox reaction is really common in ATP or energy production. That's the most common one that occurs in our body. Okay, so oxidation is when a molecule gives up electrons and releases energy. It's oxidized because it loses electrons. The oxidizing agent is the thing that took the electrons from it. So in this situation, A loses its electron, so it becomes oxidized. B took the electron, so B is the oxidizing agent. Um, usually oxygen is the one that takes the electrons, which is why it's called oxidation. Usually oxygen is the one that's doing the oxidizing and it's taking the electrons away. Reduction. Reduction is any chemical reaction in which a molecule gains electrons. So a molecule is reduced when it accepts electrons. And it's called reduced because, remember, electrons are negative. So if something has a zero charge and it takes one negative electron, now it has been reduced down to a negative one charge. So it's called reduced because it's gaining a negatively charged electron. So then the reducing agent is the thing that is giving the electrons away. So A is giving its electrons away. It is the reducing agent. And B is the oxidizing agent. 
reaction rates. Exactly what it sounds like, the rate of a chemical reaction. So reactions occur when molecules are running into each other with enough force to change the direction of something. So one molecule crashes into another and then it changes the path of that molecule. That's when a reaction occurs. So you can speed up reaction rates with different things. Some ways to speed them up are adding more reactants. So if I'm cutting wood, like say I have a wood chipper and I'm putting trees in there and I'm cutting it and cutting it and cutting it. If I don't have any trees to cut, am I cutting fast? Am I cutting a lot? No, but if I add a bunch of trees, I can cut more, right? So if we add reactants, which are the things that go into the equation, we can speed up the reaction. If we have readily available things to react, we can make the reactions happen faster. We can increase the temperature. When you increase the temperature, molecules move faster. And if we need molecules to run into each other or collide to make a reaction happen, if we make them move faster, they're more likely to hit things, hit things harder, quicker, and more frequently, right? So if we raise the temperature, we're going to speed up the rate of a reaction. And then we can use a catalyst. A catalyst is anything that increases the rate of a reaction. Typically, in the human body, enzymes are catalysts. So we use enzymes to bind to the reactants and hold them in either places or states where they need to be so that reactions can happen easier and faster. So when we use catalysts or enzymes to do these reactions, they're not changed or are affected by the reaction at all. So an enzyme can do a million reactions in a row and it never gets affected by it. Its job is literally make the reaction happen, move on to the next thing, make the reaction happen. They're never changed or affected by the actual process of the reaction happening. Organic chemistry. So organic chemistry is nothing other than the study of carbon. It is everything about carbon and why carbon is so important and how many things carbon can do. Um, carbon makes pretty much all of our macromolecules in our body. So carbohydrates, lipids, proteins, and nucleic acids are all made out of carbon. So they are all part of organic chemistry. So carbon. Carbon is a neutral atom that has four valence electrons. So it doesn't fall into the category of having three or less and wanting to give away or having five or more and wanting to gain valence electrons. It falls into its own category. It has four. Carbon likes to bond with other carbon. Carbon easily bonds with itself to create backbones of carbon. These backbones of carbon can be used to form many things. They can be used to form starches, lipids, proteins, all these things, just from the backbone of carbon. Once a backbone is formed, those carbons will start attaching to things like hydrogen, oxygen, nitrogen, sulfur, and other elements in our body very easily. So when these things cluster together and they attach to the carbon backbone, they create functional, functional groups in our bodies that are used for different things. These functional groups also make many of the properties of the macromolecules, lipids, proteins, nucleic acids, and carbs. So all of those things are created with carbon backbones and functional groups, which is the carbon backbone bonded to other things like oxygen, hydrogen, and nitrogen. Macromolecules. I was just talking about them, but they're very large organic molecules that are formed by carbon backbones. Um, they are polymers, and examples of these macromolecules, again, are carbs, lipids, proteins, and nucleic acids. All these things are formed by carbon. I mentioned the word polymers. So what is a polymer? What, is, what, it, what exactly does a polymer do, or does it come from? So a polymer is a macromolecule that is made up of a repetitive series of similar subunits. So if you look at this picture, the polymers are on the bottom, and it's two white, one black, two white, one black, two white, one black. It's repetitive, right? It's a pattern. That is a polymer. It's a subunit of something that attaches repetitively to make a chain. Those repetitive subunits are monomers. They are single subunits that can bond to each other to make a longer chain, such as a polymer. And the act of attaching to make a polymer is polymerization. So remember, 
the macromolecules are all polymers. So macromolecules, carbs, lipids, proteins, and nucleic acids, are all these chains of monomers that are attached together. Carbohydrates are hydrophilic organic molecules. And remember, hydrophilic means water-loving. So these are things that can be broken down easily by water. We especially break them down easily to make ATP, which is energy. These are our most efficient source of energy. Um, sugar, starches, breads, potatoes, bananas, anything like that is going to be where we get our energy from. When naming carbohydrates, they come from the root sacker. So anything that has sacker in it is a carbohydrate. Sacri like monosaccharides, disaccharides, those are all carbohydrates. And often in our body, carbohydrates are paired with either fats, which are lipids, or proteins. When they are paired with them, they become glycolipids or glycoproteins. Okay, monosaccharides. So the prefix mono means one, and saccharide we know means carbohydrate. So monosaccharides are a single version of a carbohydrate. They are the simplest, smallest version. The, they are made up of monomers, so a single molecule. And some examples are glucose, galactose, and fructose. Because these are so simple, it's very easy for our bodies to break them down and use them for energy. We can break them down really quickly without a lot of extra work. They're really easy for our bodies to dissolve and just use for whatever their purpose is. Next, we have disaccharides. So the prefix di means two. So a disaccharide is two monosaccharides bonded together. And when they bond, they bond covalently um, because they're made of nonmetals. You know, remember, nonmetals bond covalently. So some examples of disaccharides are lactose, which is milk sugar. It's glucose plus galactose or maltose or sucrose. Those are all examples of two monosaccharides together to form a disaccharide. Now we have polysaccharides. So the prefix poly means many. So a polysaccharide is a long chain of many, many monosaccharides. And in order to be considered a polysaccharide, there has to be at least 50 monosaccharides in that chain. Some examples of polysaccharides are glycogen, glycogen starches, and cellulose. Glycogen is how we store energy in our liver. Um, there's some in our muscles, our brain. Starch is energy storage in plants that we can eat and digest. And then cellulose is structural molecules in plants that is important for our daily, our daily fiber intake, but we do not digest cellulose. Moving on to the next macromolecule, we have lipids. Lipids are hydrophobic organic molecules because they are fats. So if you guys think about when we put fats or oils in water, they separate, they don't dissolve because they're hydrophobic, they don't like water. So fats have more calories per gram of actual weight. So if you have the same amount of fat and carbs, there are more calories in the actual fat, but we cannot break them down as efficiently as we do for carbs. So we get way less energy out of the fat. Usually we cannot break them all the way down, we end up storing them, which is why if you eat a lot of fats, you usually gain weight. We just store them, we don't break them down and use them. There are five primary types of fats in the human body, and not all of them are bad. Some of them we really need. Uh, these are fatty acids, triglycerides, phospholipids, eucosinoids, and steroids. The first type of fat we're going to talk about, or the first type of lipid, is fatty acids. So fatty acids are essential for our bodies, and we have to get them from, fruit, from food. We don't make them on our own. Fatty acids can either be saturated or unsaturated. So saturated fatty acids are saturated with hydrogen. So if you look at this picture here of this carbon backbone, remember we talked about carbon makes up all of these macromolecules. So if you look at the middle here, this whole backbone is all carbon, 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 okay? And then if you look, every single carbon can make four bonds. And if you look at them, they are all full with hydrogen. So there's not any open carbon. Each carbon has four bonds. Okay, two of the bonds are going to be to other carbons because it has to connect to the next carbon to make a chain. However, every other bond available on these, these carbons is taken up by hydrogen. The beginning has a hydrogen and the end has a hydrogen. This thing is full. Okay, there are no double bonds between the carbons because everyone is having a single bond with a hydrogen. 
An unsaturated fatty acid means that it is not fully saturated with hydrogen. There are some areas where the carbon backbone has double bonds between the carbon, meaning that if we broke this double bond right here on this bottom picture, we could actually make that a single bond between the two carbons and you could attach a hydrogen to both of those carbons. So there's room to add more hydrogens because carbon is double bonding to itself instead of to other hydrogens. So unsaturated just means that we can add more hydrogens to make it more saturated. All right, triglycerides. These are neutral fats. These are usually a glycerol with three fatty acids attached. If you look at this picture, there are three of the blue thing. Those are your fatty acids. And then there's this, this reddish colored thing over here. That's your triglycerol. Or your, your glycerol and your triglyceride when you put them together. The primary function of these is energy storage. And they also help with insulation and shock absorption. If you think about what fats do, fats are squishy and they're thick, right? So they, of course they're going to absorb shock. If you if you have a lot of fat on your body and you fall, you're going to have more padding. Babies have a lot of fat. They have a lot of padding helps them with shock absorption and it also helps them with temperature regulation because their brains are not mature enough to regulate the temperature completely on their own. That extra fat on their body helps them accomplish these goals. Um, dietary oils are triglycerides and when we think about these oils, um, they are usually liquid at room temperature. So olive oil, vegetable oil, those things are liquid at room temperature, but fats are solid at room temperature which is fats from like steak. If you cut fat off a steak, it's going to be a solid. It's not going to be liquid. So you can get your triglycerides from your oils and fats. And just remember the oils are liquid and fats are solid at room temperature. All right, phospholipids. These are really important because these make up our cells' membranes. Every cell in our body has a membrane and it's made with a phospholipid bilayer. We're going to talk a lot about phospholipids next week when we talk about the cell membrane. But for now, you need to know that a phospholipid is very similar to the neutral fats, except for instead of just being fatty acid, there is a fat and a phosphate group together. So it's a phospholipid because it's a phosphate and a fat. Okay, these, like I said, these are your structural foundation for your cell membrane. And they're amphipathic, meaning that they have a hydrophobic and a hydrophilic portion. So if you think about what this is made of, there's a phosphate and a lipid. One side has to like water and one side has to not like water. Which thing doesn't like water? Well, it's probably going to be the fatty end, right? Because we know that fat is hydrophobic. So when we look at these phospholipids, it has a hydrophilic head, which is the phosphate group, and it has a hydrophobic tail, which is the fat part. So they are a two-part fat. One part is polar and one part is nonpolar, and they're essential to our cells functioning. So here we have eicosanoids. Um, these are 20 carbon compounds. They're pretty complex, but they are very, very similar to hormones because they can send signals between cells. Um, some examples of these are prostaglandins, which are... They act very much like hormones, even though they're not, but they have really big roles in our body and things like blood clotting, um, producing hormones. They're really important for helping labor progress. So these are eicosanoids. Steroids. So our body has steroids in them naturally. They are a fat with 17 carbon atoms attached to them in some sort of shape of a ring. So, um... Steroids are synthesized from other parent steroids. So you have one steroid that makes other steroids because remember synthesize means to create. Steroids are really important for nervous function and for things like sexual reproduction, growth, stuff like that. 15% um, of our cholesterol comes from the diet and 85% of it we make ourselves. And this cholesterol is what, we, what our bodies use to make the steroids. So some examples of these steroids are cortisol. This is uh, a steroid that we release when we get stressed. Progesterone and estrogens, these are hormones released during ovulation or labor. Um, so those are the female reproductive hormones. There's testosterone, which is the male reproductive hormone, and it's also responsible 
for facial hair, the deep voice, um, the more stru square structured of a man's face. And then bile acids. And bile is the thing that is in our stomach that helps us break down food. So these are all steroids. And they are also a lipid. Okay, cholesterol. So you always hear people saying, oh, I have high cholesterol or I need to lower my cholesterol. Like it's something that's bad. Cholesterol isn't necessarily bad. We do need it. But you can have too much of the LDL, which is the kind that contributes to these problems that people talk about when they have high cholesterol. So HDL is a high density lipoprotein. So it's a high density fat protein combined. This is cholesterol that is good for you. It helps you prevent cardiovascular disease and helps your heart function properly. It keeps your arteries clear, things like that. LDL is low density lipoprotein. And this is the bad cholesterol. This is the cholesterol that clogs up your arteries. It's very, very sticky. It gets in your arteries, sticks to the wall, and sticks to itself, eventually causing cardiovascular issues. So make sure you know that HDL is good. I remember this because HDL is high. You want the high to be high. LDL is the low. You want the low to be low. Proteins. Proteins are the building blocks of our body. They build everything. So proteins are made up of a polymer of amino acids. So amino acids are the building blocks of proteins, which are the building blocks of our bodies. When the amino acids connect to make a polymer, if two or more are attached to each other, it's called a peptide. Okay, And the way they attach with each other is called a peptide bond. So two or more amino acids makes a peptide. When two or more amino acids bond together to make that peptide, that bond is a peptide bond. Okay, when lots and lots and lots of those bonded peptides come together, they make that polymer, which makes our proteins. So proteins are named for the number of amino acids that they contain. Dipeptides have two, tri have three, oligopeptides have anywhere from three to 15, and poly means 15 to 50, and then proteins are 50 or more. So a peptide chain of at least 50 amino acids makes a protein okay, and proteins are very very complex very twisted and intricately bent and turned molecules um, so they can have lots and lots of amino acids let's talk about the structure of proteins so proteins look like a big jumbled up mess but there is a very specific way that they have to be twisted and folded to work so if you look at this picture this looks like purple swirly ribbon that's all clumped together there is a very specific reason for that protein to be folded the way it is. When a protein is folded correctly, it's called conformation. Okay, so this is the protein. It receives the code to fold this way and this way and this way because of the job it's going to do. Every protein is folded and bent for the job that it needs to perform. When it does it correctly, it's called conformation. They work and they're good to go. If they do not fold correctly, or they unfold, it's called denaturation. So this destroys the protein's ability to perform its job because it's not bent, folded, or twisted correctly. So these can happen in production, or it can be damaged from something else like heat or an illness in the body, a change in pH, anything like that. So when a protein becomes denatured, it doesn't mean it's trash. We can always send it back to get refolded and then it can be checked again to see if it's functional and if so, it can move on. If it's still not folded correctly, we can send it back again. So just because it unfolds doesn't mean it's trash and just because it folded correctly doesn't mean it's always going to stay correct. It can always get ruined and then we can always fix it. Our body has lots of checks so it can go through these processes to make sure that the proteins we are making are folded correctly for the job that they're intended to do. Since proteins make everything in our body, here are some examples of what they actually more specifically make. So proteins are responsible for structures, um, specifically keratin and collagen. This is bones, cartilage, teeth, hair, skin, nails. These are all things that need protein to actually build and grow. So if you're really, really lacking protein in your diet, you might struggle to grow your hair or you might struggle to 
you don't have nice skin or grow your nails nicely because you're lacking in that. Um, communication, neurotransmitters such as hormones and other signalers, like the receptors that bind to receive the signals from the rest of the body, rely on proteins. Membrane transport. Cell membranes have proteins in the cell that protein channel receptors in the cell that accept proteins to move things in and out of cells. Without proteins, this would not happen. Um, proteins can act like catalysts. So a lot of enzymes that are used to speed up reactions rely on proteins. Um, recognition and protection. So some proteins are really important for creating white blood cells and helping our immune system to make antibodies and other things like that. Movement, the biggest thing that most people know that proteins do is it's responsible for building and repairing muscle. A lot of people that spend a lot of time in the gym or doing sports are going to be eating increased amounts of protein because it helps repair that muscle after you've worked it very hard at the gym or in sports or whatever kind of exercise you're doing. So it's really important for our muscles. And then it also helps cells bind together. So it's important for cell adhesion. So I mentioned that proteins can be catalysts with enzymes. So enzymes are proteins that function as catalysts, and a catalyst is something that speeds up the rate of reaction. So if we have a catalyst present or an enzyme present, it can make the energy needed to make that reaction happen a lot less. So these um, make things happen in our body that would take a long time to do without the enzyme. So if you're lacking enzymes, your reactions are going to slow down. A substrate is the thing that the enzyme actually acts upon. So whatever the, the enzyme is coming to act upon is the substrate. And then enzymes are usually named substrate plus ACE. So if you are work, if the enzyme is working on the amylose substrate, it's going to be called amylase. Okay, so this is the action that enzymes take. So the first thing an enzyme does when it's catalyzing something is it binds, the substrate binds to that enzyme. When that binding occurs, it makes an enzyme substrate complex. So whatever the enzyme is trying to speed up the process of, it's going to come attached to the enzyme and then it's going to make a enzyme substrate complex. Okay, the enzyme is always unchanged in this process. So the enzyme is never affected by catalyzing things. It can do this over and over and over and over again without anything happening to itself. So enzymes are never consumed by the reactions and they can catalyze millions and millions of reactions per minute, okay? Other things that can speed up the reactions or change the shape and function of an enzy enzyme are temperature, pH, um, and other factors such as bacteria and things like that in the body. They can alter the enzyme's ability to complete its job by altering its ability to bind to a substrate. So if it cannot bind to the substrate, it's not going to be able to form that complex and do its job. Um, enzymes need certain pHs to properly work. Different enzymes have different pHs because if you think about in our body, there's going to be spots that have higher pHs and lower pHs. So one spot in our body that's going to have a lower pH is our stomach. Remember, when we eat food, our stomach releases acids. So our stomach is going to be very acidic compared to, like, the inside of our mouth. Okay, our saliva is not acidic like our stomach acid. So an enzyme that works in the stomach is going to have to be able to function at a way lower pH than an enzyme that works in our mouth. And then the optimum temperature for our bodies is 37 degrees Celsius or 98.6 degrees Fahrenheit. That's perfect body temperature. Enzymes function best at that temperature. If our bodies are warmer or colder, they're going to slow down and how fast they can catalyze reactions. Enzyme cofactors. So a cofactor is a non-protein helper molecule whose presence is needed for enzymes to do their job. So this cofactor is like the co-worker of the, en of the enzyme. It needs it. Okay. Um, about two thirds of our enzymes require a cofactor. The cofactors can be a whole bunch of different things. They can be um, iron, magnesium, calcium. And these work by binding to the enzyme and triggering a change that activates the, the actual site on the enzyme that does the work. So without the cofactors binding to the enzyme, the active site doesn't get turned on. The enzyme cannot do its job. 
And then there are coenzymes. So coenzymes are things that are working with enzymes, such as vitamins. They do the same thing as the cofactors. The enzyme relies on them to get its job done. All right, metabolic pathways. A metabolic pathway is a chain of reactions that are catalyzed by enzymes within our bodies. Metabolic pathways can be turned on or off. And these can be achieved either by binding or by feedback. So if we need something made in our body, a feedback mechanism is going to turn on saying, hey, we need to make more of this. And then we'll make more. Once we reach the optimum amount, another feedback mechanism is going to send a signal back that says, hey, we have enough, stop making this. And then the production will stop. When we need that thing again, the mechanism will turn back on and the process will continue. So metabolic pathways are controlled by enzymes and they can be controlled usually through feedback mechanisms. All right, so the next macromolecule is a nucleotide. A nucleotide is an organic compound with three very specific components, a nitrogenous base, a sugar, and at least one phosphate group. Okay, so some examples of nucleotides are ATP or DNA, um, ATP is adenosine triphosphate, and it is energy for our bodies. This is what energy comes from. We have to make these molecules to make energy. We break them for energy. And then DNA. DNA is our genetic code. Nucleotides make up the building blocks of DNA. So nucleotides are very, very important for our body. One, because it writes our genetic code. And two, because if we don't have them, we don't have any energy. So here is... ATP. Okay, so this is an adenine, a ribose, and three phosphates. Its name is ATP, adenosine triphosphate, and the triphosphate means three phosphates. So ATP is the energy that our body uses. Energy is stored in the bonds between the phosphate groups. So if you look at this picture, it shows the little lightning bolt. The energy is stored in those bonds. And when we talked way back about chemical bonds, when things are bonding together, they're storing energy in the bonds. When things are breaking apart or unbonding, they are releasing energy from those bonds. So in order to get energy out of ATP, we have to break to break a bond. The bond that is broken is the bond between the second and third phosphate group because that's the one with the most energy. So we break this bond, we use the energy that comes out of it, and then we have ADP. ADP is not usable for our bodies. We can only use ATP. Remember, when we're getting our energy out of ATP, it's the second and third phosphate group that has the broken bond. That is the only bond that we break to get energy. We don't break this bond between the first and second, only the second and third. So once that bond is broken, we have ADP, adenosine diphosphate, as in two phosphates. Like I said before, we cannot use ADP. It doesn't do anything for us, but we don't throw it away. We can take that ADP and put another phosphate group on it to make it ATP again, because it's all it's lacking is that third phosphate. So we can get that phosphate through food. We eat food, we get phosphates, those phosphates go find that ADP molecule, and they reattach to make it ATP again. Once it is ATP, we can break the bond again and use it for energy. And the cycle will continue and continue and continue. We will always reuse the ADP until there's something else wrong with it. If it's damaged in another way, we cannot reuse it. But it's always reusable as long as it is ADP. We can add the phosphate, break it again, get our energy. And lastly, we have nucleic acids. Nucleic acids are polymers of nucleotides. So we talked about nucleotides and ATP. If we put a whole bunch of these nucleotides together, we make nucleic acids. Nucleic acids make up DNA and RNA. DNA is deoxyribonucleic acid, okay? This makes up the genetic code for everything in our body. Okay, it writes the instruction for everything in our body, how it should work, how often it should work, what it should do. That's DNA's job. It also makes up RNA. So RNA is responsible for carrying out genetic instruction for making other things or making new things. And, and make sure that amino acids are producing proteins correctly and that when our cells divide and split, that it's done correctly. 
So these things are very important. And we will talk about DNA a lot more when we get to chapter four and we talk about the genetic.